All right, if you have a Bible, and I hope you do, why don't you open it up to Colossians chapter 3, and uh, I'll read the passage here in just a moment. We're doing a series called The Gospel for Real Life, and we're thinking through how the good news of Jesus Christ applies to all sorts of different areas of ordinary life, including work. So that's our text for today, Colossians 3, 23 through chapter 4, verse 1, and we're thinking through how the gospel applies to our work. Let me read it, and then we'll pray, and we will get after it. Colossians 3, starting in verse 22. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor, favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favoritism. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. Let's pray. Lord, as we've opened your word together, we want to hear from you. So we're praying that by your spirit, through your word, you would speak. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to consider the way in which the gospel informs our entire lives and even the way in which we go about our work. Help us to do that, please, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, the first thing we need to do is just kind of wrap our heads around some of the concepts here because it is, it, it is bizarre. This is one of those passages where you go, slavery, huh? Well, that's kind of interesting. I'm not sure what that means exactly, but I'm also not sure that that feels like a relevant concept anymore. Or if it's in the Bible, we might even be skeptical. Maybe this is just kind of that archaic portion of the Bible that we kind of want to shield ourselves from, skip over, and get on to the more relevant and practical stuff. So we have to define the terms and, and, and the situation in which this letter is written. Now, there's a book, it's a, a, a textbook, it's called The New Testament in Antiquity. It's written by scholars, and they, in that book, what they're doing is they're looking at the context in which the, the New Testament was given to us, and, and they, they point this out. They say, no, this is slavery. This is slavery in the sense of people being forced into work. This was a normal thing in that first century. They talk about how the society during that time was hierarchical and far from egalitarian, that there were different classes, and slavery was at the bottom. It was the lowest class in that first century society. And then above them was freed men and freed women, and those were people who were formerly slaves but had been either liberated by their master or had gone through a process called manumission where they could obtain their freedom. And so that would be an, a, a step up from slavery. And then you had that higher level of those who were born free. And so the class ranking within society reflected this unjust reality. And slaves were people who were forced into slavery because of military uh, advancements and people becoming prisoners of war and then being forced into slavery. So it's interesting, isn't it? We, we need to sit here and go, wait a minute. So Paul talked to people who were enslaved and he told them to work hard. Hmm. Maybe this is just old school stuff and maybe you know it offends our modern sensibilities and we're well beyond that so maybe this is a passage that isn't even relevant for us today because of speaking of such ancient things well the truth is this is not an endorsement of slavery if you read the bible and people have done this they come to the conclusion that the bible is against these sorts of things and in fact if it weren't for the bible there would not be significant movements like the abolition of slavery in Europe and America. It is believers who have led the charge by reading their Bibles right and recognizing what God says about the value of every human being and the inappropriateness of ever treating another person as physical property. It's the Bible that has led to people 
working against racism and classism and sexism and slavery and things of the sort. It is the Bible that has informed people in this direction. In fact, there's an atheist professor of philosophy at the University of Paris. His name is Luke Ferry, or if you're American, we just say Luke Ferry. Um, but he said, Christianity rested its case on the human person and this unprecedented concept of love. And he said, without Christianity, the philosophy of human rights that we subscribe to today would have never established itself. An atheist in Paris is saying, the, the sensibilities that we have about the dignity of every person and the rights intrinsic to them, that has come by way of Christianity and its forcefulness of causing us to think through the value of every person and the dignity and the rights that are intrinsic to them. So again, the question that I'm wrestling with is, why is this here and how can Christians operate in societies where there are unjust structural realities that are out of step with God's desire, right? Because we're still living in a day and age where, where there, there are unjust realities. And so we need to think through, does this text have anything for us today? Does this text speak to us today? And it, it does. Now, slavery in the first century was normal. And so when Paul's writing to a church, that was one of the main vocations of almost everybody in the congregation. So he's going to speak into this reality, and he's saying, look, as you go about your ordinary work, there's a way in which the gospel informs it. And it informs it really in such a way that it, it, it will help you to glorify Christ, and also it will have an effect on that society. So we're dealing with this concept of work, and Paul is helping us to think through how Christians ought to work. Now, before I go any further, let me just say some things about work. Work is significant. It's a major part of the human experience. And I believe that we need, that, that Christi Christianity today really needs a better understanding of work according to what God has said. Instead of viewing work as this necessary evil that we do to get a paycheck, we need to recognize the, the biblical testimony start to finish is that work is a good thing. It's a God thing. God is a worker. The Bible starts out that way. God worked for six days, and then he rested. And when he creates humanity, he gives humanity jobs. He says, Adam, here's, here's your task for today. You need to name everything. You've got a job to do. And then he places Adam and Eve in the garden, and he says, okay, you, I'm going to give you an assignment. You've got some work to do. Your responsibility, your vocation is to guard and keep this garden. Work predates the fall. Now, obviously, sin has affected everything, including our work. But Jesus himself said that his father is always working, and he too is going about that work. So when we think about our jobs, our vocations, our, the things that we put energy and effort to, we need to recognize that that is a good and a God thing. Work is a good thing. And by the way, some of you don't have jobs yet. I would argue you are still working. If you're a young person, you've got a lot of work to do. You have to go to school, and that's work. And you're doing a bunch of knowledge work, and that's important because we believe that young people need to be instructed in certain things, and you need to know certain things about the world in which you live. There's a bunch of knowledge work there. There's also social skills that you need to learn. Uh, you, you don't just come into the world fully capable of dealing with other human beings. You need to learn how to do that. That's work. There's all kinds of work. Now, there are some who are stay-at-home parents. I would argue that's the hardest work, right? If you've uh, had kids, especially at a young age, there were plenty of days where I said, you know what? I can't wait to go to work. That's easier than the work of parenting. So work is not just something that you clock into and clock out of, really. It's just a part of the human experience. We, we all work in a variety of different ways. So this text then helps us to think through, what does it mean to be a Christian and work? So let's look at this now. There are three aspects of work described for us here in the text. The manner in which we work the motivation for our work, and the mission opportunity within our work. So the manner of work 
When we go about whatever it is that we're working at, we actually need to be the kind of people as Christians who say, I'm going to do my job and I'm going to do it very well. I'm going to do my job and I'm going to do it very well. And I'm going to do all things that are required of me. Look at verse 22. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything. It's saying, regardless of what kind of master you have, regardless of what sorts of things you do as a slave, it's saying when you go about your work, you need to be willing as a Christian to do everything that is assigned to you. You need to be willing to do the jobs that you like and the jobs that you don't like. You need to be willing to do all things that may be required from you. I grew up at Williams Tree Farm. That was my first job. I uh, was working for my parents at the tree farm. Now, one of the things that I've noticed over the years is there are a lot of things at the tree farm that people really like to do. There's a job of taking care of puppies. That one doesn't take a lot of work to, to fill that task, right? People are like, I'd love that. I'll hold the puppies. I'll feed and water the puppies. I'll change you know, the, the uh, bedding and whatnot and all these different things. People love that. But there are jobs at the tree farm that people avoid, that people do not like to do. There are many of them. One of them is spraying the trees, and you have to wear a whole hazmat suit and a mask and all this stuff. And you know, we try to do it in the fall and do it on cooler days, but often it's just blazing hot. And there's a motor that's pumping stuff, and you're spraying you know, fertilizer and different things on the trees. And you, it's just hours and hours on end of monotonous work where you can't even talk to other people because there's a big motor right there between you. That's the kind of job that people avoid. And they go, I think I'm busy. I think we're on a family vacation when you guys are doing that. I'm not even sure when you're doing that, but I'll be on a vacation. That's the kind of thing that people often do. So this is telling us, Christians, whatever assignment might be required from you in your work, do it. Be willing to do that work. Why? Because you're a Christian. Do whatever is needed and do it exceptionally well. That's the second thing as we think through the manner of work. We need to be willing to do our job with all of our heart. Look at verse 23. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. In other words, you don't go into work and go, okay, I don't enjoy this, so I'm just going to do it in a half-hearted way. I'm not going to do a great job here. I'm just going to do enough that it gets by. You know, there's a report that I have to do, and I'm not happy about it, so I'm just going to complete that and send it off and hope nobody cares. There's stuff that needs to happen around here, and I'm not going to work very hard or very swiftly at getting it done, and I'm not going to try to do it with a manner of excellence. I'm just going to, I'm just going to get it done. No, this says you need to work at whatever it is you're doing wholeheartedly. Whatever's before you, whatever's happening, you say, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this really, really well. And again, it says, whatever you do. So this means that all of our work is significant. There are not different distinctions between the kinds of work that we do, and we go, well, some things are, some things are better. I mean, I suppose we might be able to make that distinction, but the truth is, this is, this is dignifying almost all work, with very little qualifications. So I've had people say to me, okay, Cor, when I think about my job, I feel like it doesn't really matter. Like, I know I do it, and it earns a paycheck, and that's all important stuff, but that's not really where my heart is. My heart is in other stuff, and so my job is a means to an end of doing other things that I think would be more pleasing to God. But this reminds us that whatever it is that we're doing can actually be done for the Lord. So instead of thinking, my job doesn't matter, you go, okay, I just make these little widgets and nobody cares and it doesn't really do anything and, you know, I'm just doing this job. No, no, no. If you play it forward and you think through your role in creating something that can benefit society and benefit other people, oftentimes there is a direct connection there, that what you do is significant. So, for instance... Last week, I'm standing out here on the air conditioning tower, and I've got this thing open. I'm not a technician. I'm not an electrician. I don't know what I'm doing up there. I'm looking at stuff, and I'm thinking, you know what I would really like? For these little parts to do what they're supposed to do, right? There's a big blower motor on this thing. We're supposed to turn that thermostat to a certain temperature, 
whatever crazy stuff happens, that stuff needs to work. Because somebody in a factory, engineering it, designing it, doing quality control, if you're a believer, all that stuff matters because on a Sunday morning when we're all gathered in here, we want that to work. And that's a blessing to a lot of us. Or if it's at your house, you certainly want that to work when it's over 90 degrees. You want these little things. And so you might go to work and go, this doesn't really matter. But maybe it does. Maybe your performance and the things that you are creating will be a blessing to somebody. And you've not even really thought through that. And you're too busy grumbling about the work that you're doing to really think through, no, 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 how I perform my job is a God thing and it's a blessing to society itself. Well, we need to be good workers then. The manner in which we go about our work should be diligent. It should be productive. We should be doing our work with excellence and it should be observable. So we should, we should be so incredibly industrious that if, if we were called to do something else, our company would say, it will be very hard to replace you. It will be very, very hard to find a replacement for you because the way that you work is exceptional. That's what we're talking about here. Well, secondly, we get motivations for work. Not only are we supposed to do our work in a certain way, we're supposed to be inspired to do it because of our Christian convictions. Verse 22, we're to do it with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. I'm just going to work hard, but grumble about it and go, look at, look at how productive I am, but I hate my job. No, 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 there's a sincerity and a reverence for the Lord. We're to be working in a way that, that reveals our commitments. We do our job, and we do it well, and we do it with sincerity. We do it also not just to be seen by others. Look at verse 22. Do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor. A lot of people go through life, and they're thinking, Okay, I want people to notice. I'm going to work really hard, but here's why. I want people to notice so that I'll either get a raise, I'll get more compensation, or, or um, I'll get an applause at least. Somebody will pat me on my back and say, you're doing a great job here, and, and you deserve to be recognized. Well, that is not how the Christian goes about their work. They do it. They can do thankless jobs. They, they can do jobs that nobody will ever reward and nobody will ever thank. Why? Because we are doing it not for ourselves and not to be seen by others, but we're doing it for the Lord. Look at verse 23. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. You're doing your job not to be seen, not to be seen by others at least, but to, you know that God sees and he cares and he rewards. You're working as unto the Lord, and that changes everything. You're working with all your heart unto the Lord, not for a paycheck, not for applause, but for your king. Now, there's also a feature here that motivates us, and it's the awareness of the judgment of God. Judgment, often we hear that word and we think that's a negative thing, but really from the biblical witness, it's a positive thing. It means that God is going to set things right. That's what judgment means. God is going to judge the earth. He's going to make all things right. And here we find out that those who are faithful in their work will be rewarded, and those who are lazy and negligent and wrongful in their work will be repaid for those wrongs. So we'll be rewarded. Look at verse 24. It says, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as reward. So you know that God is observing your conduct. And you know, even if your boss never takes notice of your work, that you have a heavenly father who is evaluating your heart and your productivity, and he's able to see you and reward you for your faithfulness. You will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. So you, you can do thankless jobs, and, and you can earn less money than other people, because you know that God one day will reward you handsomely for your faithfulness. But then there's the negative side of it, and it is punishment. It says in verse 25, anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favoritism. God not only sees your productivity, your activity, and your performance, he also sees when you cut corners. There are some people who think, you know what, I'll just work a 20-hour week, 
and get paid for 40 because nobody's really going to care. But God sees and he does care. Some of us think, well, we'll just, I'll just half-heartedly go about my work. I'm not really going to invest myself here. I'm not really going to work hard or try to better the, the company or the clients. I'm just going to do bare minimum stuff around here. Well, God sees that. He sees as we cut corners in that sort of way. Or when we underproduce because we think that nobody is holding our hand or forcing us to remain accountable. The, the truth is, this text is reminding us there's a day coming where God will settle all accounts. And the way in which we work truly matters. The way in which you clock in tomorrow and start your work day and you get after some of the things in front of you this week, it all matters because God sees. And so you need to be motivated with sincerity, with a conviction that you're doing it for the Lord, and with an awareness that you will be judged accordingly. Now, this doesn't only apply to the worker. It applies to the employer as well. It says in verse 1 of chapter 4, Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. It's telling us that the, the employer needs to conduct their business with their employees in a way that's right. He's saying, look, here's the motivation. You have a master in heaven. If you're a believer, you know that you report to somebody else, to God. And you need to treat your employees like God treats you. How does he treat us? Better than we deserve. He gives us grace. He's patient with us. He's forbearing with us. He treats us way better than we deserve. So when you're an employer and you're taking care of your employees, it should look and feel like that. Because you're saying, I'm relating to you just like my heavenly father and my master relates to me. So there's a motivation then. God sees and he will settle all accounts. But the, the key motivation here is one that's actually traveling through this whole chapter and maybe even this whole letter. The key motivation for working is the good news of the gospel. The, the, the chief motivation for being a good worker as a believer is the, the motivation of the good news of the gospel. It is the lordship of Christ. It's the reality that Christ is alive and he has died for us and he has risen and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And when we begin to understand how the gospel should inform our work, that itself is a motivating reality. So that truth of Christ's rule and reign and our working as unto him actually changes the dynamic of the workforce. And when that happens, it changes us individually, but it also has the ability to change society itself. I think that's one of the reasons why Paul doesn't condemn slavery here, because he's going to do something very subversive. He's going to undermine slavery from the inside out. He's going to take workers who are in this unjust system, and he's going to inspire them with the power of the gospel to actually change slavery and make it inappropriate and no longer permissible in all sorts of society. So he's saying, look, what you're doing is you're onboarding some of the reality of heaven. That's the argument of Colossians, and I'll show it to you in just a moment, but you're onboarding the reality of heaven in real time because you have a different commitment. You're not beholden to culture or society. You have a different commitment. You serve a king. And in him, these concepts, they no longer apply to you. In fact, that's what he says in verse 11. If you look up, you can see it there. He says, here in Christ or in Christ's kingdom, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free. But Christ is all and is in all. In Christ, that, those categories are abolished. Slave and free, they go away. Now, they go away in the future, but we're starting to onboard it right now. Those realities are being demolished by our commitment to Christ. And so this becomes a radical text for subversive change in our world. Christians can be people who are helping to make the world a better place, and we need it. We need Christians to help with slavery and human trafficking and the residual effects of race-based slavery and racism, and we need Christians to start behaving as if Christ is Lord and to start doing that in real time, in real space, so that these things become less and less powerful in our world. Well, finally, then, we have this 
missional opportunity within our work. One of the things that this is saying is that there is a way that we can work that makes God look real. There's a way in which we work that makes the reality of heaven and the hope of Christ feel real. And we've already bumped into it in our text because it keeps reminding us that we have a a master, a boss in heaven. And by working for him and unto him, we're showing people our greatest commitments. But the whole letter actually points in this direction. The whole letter is explaining that the good news of the gospel can show up in real time and real space in the ordinary things of life, and it reveals those truths about God and about his kingdom. So the context helps us to know that what the good news of the gospel has accomplished actually changes all sorts of things. It changes how we deal with each other at church in verses 12 to 17 of chapter 3. It changes our home life in verses 18 to 21, both how we parent and our marriages and how children relate to parents. It changes our work, and that's the passage that we've been looking at. And then in chapter 4, it tells us how the reality of the gospel changes the dynamic that we have with outsiders who aren't a part of the community of faith yet. So our work then is situated in this bigger, bigger reality. Let me show it to you briefly. We'll fly through these passages here, but in verse 1 of chapter 3, it tells us, since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So because of your relationship with God through Christ, you've been raised with him. This is the good news of the gospel. Here's what you should do then. Set your heart on that. As somebody who believes in the gospel, set your heart on these things above where Christ is and is seated at the right hand of God. Verse 5 of chapter 3 says, in in view of that then, put off or put to death whatever belongs to the earthly nature. Put off sinfulness. Put off being grumpy. Put off being all these different things that reveal a lack of faith in God. Put those things off and put on Christ-likeness. Put on the reality of what it looks like to live in the world as Christ has. Verse 12 says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Put on Christ-likeness. In light of the gospel that you were seated with Christ, that you were raised with him, set your heart on those things. Put off the earthly, put on the Christ-like. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. And then he says, if you're doing that, then everything that you do falls in line with the good news of the gospel. If you're doing that, if you're setting your heart on things above where Christ is, and you're putting off the earthly, putting on the Christ-like, covering all of that with love, then whatever you do can be done for God's glory. Look at verse 17. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to the Father through him. What is this saying then? It's saying that everything that we do under the banner of the gospel can be done in the name of Christ and for his glory. Parenting, being a child, being a spouse, going to work. All these things can be done in the name of Christ and for his glory. So the call to work as a Christian is a call to reflect the glory of God and Christ. It's the call to help people see the allegiance that you have to God and his ways. So I've been thinking about it this week, and and I've been thinking about how badly we would love to see the world change. There are all sorts of things that we wish would be reformed, And and I've been thinking about this text in light of all of that this week, and I've been thinking through, you know what? One of the most profound ways that we could participate in God changing the world is by going to work. It's by going to work in the manner described here. It's by living out the reality of the gospel in real time so that people see that there is a king and a kingdom that transcends all of this. And one day, that king is going to come, and he's going to make all things right. And in the meantime, we're going to go about the business that he's given to us. 
and we're going to participate in this world in a redemptive way, and there are going to be moments where, like Paul, we speak out against evils of the day, and we give voice to it, but we're also going to, with wisdom, graciously go about the ordinary assignments that God has given us, recognizing that there is gospel power in that as well. So let's be people who, with whatever we do, whether in word or deed, we do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let's pray. Lord, I ask right now that you would help us as a church to onboard some of this truth about the the dignity and the value of work itself. And in a society where work ethic seems so low, And it seems so challenging to find people who are willing to simply do a job and do it well. I pray that your church, your people, would populate all kinds of jobs and vocations. And they would do it in your name and for your glory in such a way that people would come to know the Son in a saving way. And Lord, would you exponentially grow that tribe so that things like slavery would be abolished. And so that things like racism would no longer have traction. Help us, Lord, to change the world in your name, by your strategies, and for your glory. And we need help. Lord, we're we're just admitting how hard this is. And so we're asking for your spirit to anoint us. And help us, even tomorrow morning, or I guess Tuesday morning, whenever it is this week that we clock in, help us to do that for your name and for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.